Good morning, um, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. Um, today's webinar is the third in the All About Webinar series brought to you by North Coast Local Land Services. My name is Gwen Garrett. Um, I'm a local land, a land services officer for the North Coast Local Land Services, and I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all here today and to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the nations on which we live, work and play. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and future and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people that are joining us today. As I mentioned, today's webinar is the third in this series and today's webinar is going to be about soil fertility. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. You can see the public chat there where everyone can type a question and that's where we'll see them and we can collate them to answer, to answer them at the end. If there are quick questions, quick and easy questions to answer, David um, will do that as we go along. Um, so I'm just going to introduce David now. David has had 20 years experience in rural landscapes, farming and food systems. He's currently works for soil, land and food um, and delivers extension projects for them. He has a wide ranging career working in both management and technical roles and, and he enjoys empowering farmers with knowledge and skills that make a difference. So without further ado, I'll pass over to David and, and start today's webinar. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Gwen. Uh, yeah, thanks for everyone who's come back to another, the final in the webinar series all about soils here with the North Coast LLS. Um, yeah, welcome back. We're on the uh, home stretch in, in terms of the series and today we're tackling the big topic of soil fertility, also known as soil nutrients. Welcome back. As usual, we've got a bit to cover um, and so I better jump straight in and as Gwen said, please feel free to put your questions into the chat and we can try and tackle as many as possible in our time frame. Um, so yeah, let's jump straight into soil fertility here and uh, what it is and the basics of how you can manage it well. So I guess today's topic is really soil fertility and how to manage it well. They're the two um, key things. So we'll look at some of the fundamentals of soil fertility briefly and then the key steps in managing it. Um, and the specific topics that we'll uh, scoot through today is soil nutrients, where they come from, um, like where do nutrients actually start, uh, then how they cycle. So I'll just give you a bit of a framework to think about when you think about nutrients, like how they actually move through your soil and into plants and out of plants and into microbes, etc. Um, um, through what I call two bucket and five bucket thinking. So we'll get to those two as well and um, trying to see nutrient cycling as a, a holistic system, if you like, through five bucket thinking. And finally, we'll cover um, yeah, the key, for what I call the five steps to success when you're managing soil fertility, um, because it's easy to spend a lot of money on your soil um, in the terms of fertilizers or making efforts to improve fertility to drive production for your farm business or your grazing business. Um, but yeah, there are five sort of steps to follow if you do want to try to have success that, that I feel um, will lead you in the right direction. Um, and again, if you have any burning questions uh, like the last two webinars, please feel free to punch them into chat. We'll pause um, and cover a couple of them if we need to, if they're really directly pertinent uh, as we go through. Otherwise, we'll cover them at the end as best we can. All right, let's jump straight in and start to explore soil fertility with our friend uh, Fred the Earthworm, who of course is a key part of fertility in the soil. Um, so I guess in a nutshell, if we kind of summarise the whole thing before we start, soil fertility is the level of nutrients in a soil. It's the level of nutrients in a soil. For example, phosphorus, nitrogen, sulphur, zinc, copper, etc. Like there's a whole lot of nutrients um, that plants and animals and life needs. And soil fertility is really the level that there is in any particular soil. Um, another way that we often talk about soil fertility is um, we go, uh, we've got available nutrients and unavailable nutrients and that's really what equals my total fertility in my soil. What's available and un what's unavailable, those two together equals total fertility. So we will use those terms a bit today 
but I'm going to try and go beyond just available and unavailable as we step into five bucket thinking as I call it. Okay, so let's start with a big one. Where do nutrients actually come from? Where does the whole thing start? Um, and so for most of for all of life on Earth, um, the source of most nutrients is actually from the minerals in the Earth's crust. So in the surface of the Earth, underneath the topsoil is the crust of the Earth where the rocks are. And basically almost all, not all, but almost all the nutrients that we deal with in agriculture uh, come from the minerals in the Earth's crust, in the rocks. Um, but there is a few that cycle through the air and in particular the big one is nitrogen which doesn't, it does live a bit in the crust but its main um, bank where it lives is actually the air, the air we breathe. But it's 80% of the air, nearly 78%. So most nutrients come mainly from the rocks that soils form from uh, as most nutrients elements are stored in that soil. Here's this soil I think you guys have seen if you've seen the other webinars which is up on the back of the Liverpool Plains the Liverpool Range there forming from rocks uh, on quite a young landscape. And so through a process called weathering, rocks break down to minerals. So here's a granite soil in the New England where the rocks are breaking down into soil minerals. And those minerals uh, are really what determine a soil's fertility. So here's a soil out in western New South Wales that has different minerals and it's really the um, fertility of a soil, the level of nutrients in it is really determined mostly by um, those minerals, the type of minerals. So as different soils have different mixes of different minerals in them, whether it's quartz, feldspar, iron minerals, etc., you therefore get, uh, which we call parent material or the mineral composition or sometimes you'll see on YouTube some of the Yanks are going mineral matrix. Um, but basically the nutrients are coming from the parent material or that mineral composition of our soil. And so different soils have different mineral compositions uh, as they come from different rocks basically, that's the bottom line. Uh, and as those different soils have different minerals, they therefore have different levels of nutrients and a different balance of nutrients or different proportions of nutrients like one soil might have a high amount of magnesium in it and another soil a low amount but a high amount of potassium proportionally. So that's all really due to the mineralogy of the soil that the soil's formed from, that the soil minerals are formed from. So the overall level and balance of nutrients in a topsoil is what we call soil fertility. Um, sometimes overall soil fertility is sometimes sort of called total nutrient reserves, especially because you can measure your your overall fertility using a sort of a special test or an extra test or a standard agronomic test called a totals estimate. Uh, so we sometimes call it the total nutrient reserves and for example um, looking at phosphorus you might have a soil type that has 150 parts per million total phosphorus uh, and here we've got a, a soil and a volcanic landscape in Victoria that might have a total phosphorus of over 2,000. Um, so you might go on a, on a light, low fertility soil where phosphorus is very low and a, a different soil type, maybe on volcanic soils, where the total phosphorus is very high. So this overall fertility does vary greatly. A soil's overall fertility is also influenced by a couple of other factors apart from the minerals. The minerals are the heart of the matter, uh, except for nitrogen of course, but how old a landscape is and how long it's been weathered for uh, and also how intensively the rain is. So in the tropical areas of the world, the leaching and weathering of minerals is more intense. So those factors also determine kind of how many nutrients I'm going to have in my topsoil at any time. Okay, so that's really where the nutrients sort of come from. They come from minerals or in the case of nitrogen, they come from the air originally. Um, so if there's any questions or there's no questions, so I'm just going to keep scooting on and we're going to look now at how nutrients cycle, um, you know, what is the process, particularly in soils that we're managing for agriculture, how do they sort of move and how do, we, how do they cycle. So let's jump into the nutrient cycling story. Um, so for most of life on earth, the topsoil is a really key part of the nutrient cycling story. So wherever you are on the planet, uh, pretty much except in the oceans of course, but on the land, the topsoil is actually a really, really important part of where nutrients ex exchange. So it's pretty much it's a complex living community, the topsoil, like it's full of microbes and soil organisms and it's in partnership with plant roots 
And that community of life and plant roots is mixing with soil minerals, which obviously contain nutrients. And the whole thing is being influenced by climate, by, by seasons, by rainfall, um, by fire, by a whole lot of sort of geographic influence as well. And that whole system um, is what's sort of where nutrients cycle, if you like. So if we look at that in a bit more detail, this first key process is that the nutrients that are in minerals, actually as those minerals keep weight breaking down through time, which remember is called weathering, if you've seen the first webinar, um, those soil minerals keep breaking down and at a certain point the nutrients in them actually get released. So the minerals break down to such a degree that minerals actually get released from them and we call that solubilisation, making the nutrients more soluble if you like. So they're no longer sort of locked up in any way, shape or form. So this solubilisation results in the nutrients being released from the minerals and therefore they're in what we call soluble forms and sometimes they get released directly into, so say for example, a soil microbe or fungi that's, that's accessing the mineral. So they can get released into directly into biological forms, um, but they become available. At this point, the nutrients become available. Before that, they were kind of unavailable or, or, or not cycling is probably a better term, but now they're kind of available for life. So the term we sometimes use is bioavailable. So once nutrients become available, they tend to cycle. They tend to move. Um, different nutrients move at different speeds and in different ways, but they tend to cycle through the living community on the planet. So obviously there's, uh, they move from microbes into soil organisms that might eat a microbe or into an earthworm that eats a bit of plant material into plants. Obviously plants take up nutrients through their roots um, in various ways. So the nutrients are moving into plant material and then animals come along and eat those plants So then the nutrients move them and then we either eat plants if we're uh, eating plant-based diet or we might eat meat or dairy and so then we're taking up the nutrients from them. So the nutrients are cycling round and round and then when things poo or die some of those nutrients go back into the air, the water, the soil or even back to the rocks. So nutrients, they tend to move and they tend to cycle and uh, round and round they cycle it various speeds. Um, so that's kind of nutrient cycling in a very brief nutshell. Uh, and the key important thing to note though with a topsoil is that this nutrient cycling process is really driven by the activity of plants because plants photosynthesize and they provide energy or in the form of carbon or carbohydrates to all the other life in the soil and, and on the planet basically. And the two key things that we all need are energy and nutrients. Um, as living beings, we need energy in the form of carbohydrates or carbon, and we need nutrients. So obviously the energy that plants bring in and convert from solar energy to carbohydrates is critical for driving nutrient cycling. So nutrients won't cycle if there's not energy to s support that process. Um, and so in natural landscapes, the complex ecological community of life in the soil, so the plant roots and all the microbes and the soil community, along with the plants, have co-evolved. So they've all kind of evolved together in this complex partnership, if you like. And that's what a topsoil is. It's a partnership between plants and the biodiversity in the soil and the soil minerals. Um, and so that complex system makes nutrients available for minerals. So there's a co-evolutionary process where nutrients are being made, if you like, made available from the mineral processes and cycled in an adequate and balanced way through the whole community for the plants, for the living things. So um, in a rainforest like this one, for example, you know, there's a whole complex system that kind of gets nutrients cycling because it's in everyone's evolutionary interest for nutrients to cycle because that's, without that you're not going to survive. So there's this complex system and um, the ecological community, if you like, optimises the nutrient cycling capacity, I call it, of a soil. So the ability of a soil to cycle nutrients effectively in a balanced way is really driven by this community in a, in a kind of almost orchestra. Uh, and this is a little forest soil. Um, you can see very different than in, in a pasture, but it's the same process going on where there's this orchestra system doing the job. The, in ecology, we call this self-organisation or sometimes um, adaptive systems. And so the system will kind of organise itself to optimise that nutrient cycling. Uh, 
Um, and so that's an interesting way to look at soils, if you like, and how the nutrients move. So this optimal nutrient cycling state is driven by plant roots, biological diversity, soil life, air, water and temperature, obviously we need those things, and then animals and what type of disturbance, is there fire, is there um, cyclones, is there um, cold, cold snaps, so all of those things are also influencing this system. Um, but And the final thing to remember when we talk about nutrient cycling is uh, the productivity of an area like the nutrient cycling and fertility of an area is greatly limited by the type of the natural soil fertility of a soil type um, so you know the, the natural underlying soil type has a certain amount of fertility and to a great extent you know the productivity of a landscape is is influenced by that um, as well I've got a question come in there for uh, in there about what the common soil fertility constraints on the north coast are. I might come back to that one when we talk about managing nutrients. And Gwen's put in there, you've spoken about increasing soil fertility in pasture systems. Are there similar practices for increasing soil fertility in cropping systems? Um, yeah, so I guess Gwen, to give you, a, um, whether it's pasture or, or cropping systems, you're trying to optimise the cycling, or I guess the first step you're trying to do, which we'll come to, is optimise the cycling of whatever what is already there, so you're trying to make the nutrients that are already in your soil, topsoil, available and cycling more efficiently, and that's where diversity of plants definitely helps drive that, improve that system, and also air, water, soil structure. So it's the same principle for, for a pasture system or in horticulture or cropping, um, and yes, can we therefore lower our reliance on outside fertilisers? And definitely you can. The question is how low can you go, I guess. And that depends a little bit on your economic goals as well as the soil type. But I might come back to that too as well when we talk about managing nutrients. So let's, um, on that note, let's not, hopefully that gives you a bit of an answer, Gwen, anyway. So let's come now to kind of the different perspectives on how to manage nutrients that you sort of see in what I call modern agronomy. Uh, and I label them as two bucket thinking versus five bucket thinking. And so let's sort of see how, you know, how can we manage, what, what are the views we can take to manage our, our fertility uh, effectively. So in agriculture, whether it's a pasture or a crop, etc., our aim is to optimise soil cycle fertility. And that means, I guess, having enough nutrients, but also having them cycle really well. So we're trying to achieve an adequate and balanced available nutrients for our crops or pastures. Um, we want them to be adequate and balanced. Um, and so what is an adequate and balanced level of available nutrients will depend on three things. So uh, for me to have adequate and available nutrients for if I'm growing macadamia nuts or if I'm growing uh, dairy pastures for dairying or I'm growing beef pastures up the back of um, say casino, the level of nutrients and the balance between them may be quite different depending on my production goals. So the three things that your nutrient level, your nutrient goals will depend on is your enterprise, your production goals, what you're trying to achieve, uh, and the economics of it. So, you know, soil fertility, there's, in a way, there's no wrong and right because it's really what you're trying to achieve. Whereas soil health, you need soil structure and organic matter and functioning soil community no matter what you grow. So you kind of need soil health no matter what enterprise you have, but the level of fertility that you need will depend a lot on what your enterprise is and what your economic goals are. So it's a little bit of a relative thing as opposed to soil health, which was a, is a lot more of a kind of permanent thing that everyone kind of needs soil health no matter what you're doing. We're often trying to achieve landscape productivity though uh, above the natural levels, and this is the important thing, the difference that humans, we do in agriculture, is we go, yeah, we, we're happy with the cows grazing here, but we want to grow more, we want to have more animals or more production. So, you know, the climate and the soil type sets a lot of the level of production, and we often want to have more than that. So we, one of the ways we try to do that is to increase fertility by adding fertilisers. You know, let's lift the productivity here. But we're still limited by climate and soil type to a great extent. We can't really pretend that they don't exist. So we have to work within their constraints to a great extent. But yeah, we often try and increase things by adding nutrients or fertilisers. So the 20th century approach to it is to 
is what I call two bucket thinking. So this is the sort of 20th century approach to agronomy when you're managing nutrients. And the two bucket approach is where I call it two bucket thinking and the two buckets are available nutrients and unavailable. So you kind of have these available nutrients for my plants and then I have all the rest of it which is unavailable. And the assumptions of two bucket thinking are that plants take up their nutrients from the soluble bucket or you know as quite soluble nutrients uh, and from this available bucket. Uh, and this available bucket is mainly what we call the soil solution. So the, the, the nutrients in water or that are relatively dissolved. So that's kind of the two bucket thinking and I guess the goal is to keep enough available nutrients or make sure you have enough available nutrients for your production goals. So that's really the heart of what I call two bucket thinking. Um, generally the other assumptions to it is that you're relying on solubility. Um, it's a passive uptake so the plants kind of passively uptake from this soluble bucket. Um, you use the estimate to, to do this sort of approach you have to estimate available nutrients on a soil test and the main fertiliser and I'm generalising because obviously there's exceptions but the main way people kind of keep their available nutrient levels adequate for themselves is to add soluble fertilisers into the available bucket. So that's kind of that 20th century two bucket approach where we, we want to keep enough available nutrients in our soluble bucket for our production goals if you like. Um, and that's really the heart of, of modern agronomy in, in many areas of the world. Um, with the 21st century and our understanding about ecology and how plants grow and the complexity of soils and things, there's actually a bit more to it than that and I think what's, what's emerging is what I call this 21st century view of soils and agronomy and nutrient management um, based on adding soil ecology to the chemistry and everything else we already know. So there's a bit more to the nutrient cycling than just available and unavailable. It certainly gets a job done, that approach, I'm not arguing that, but there's a bit more to it and we can probably fine tune our model a bit more than just available and unavailable. So let me introduce you to what um, I call a five bucket model and I guess it's a little bit more of a holistic approach uh, where we need to look a bit more at the whole system um, because nutrient cycling is an active process, it's not a passive process where you kind of just hope there's available nutrients and if not you add more. Uh, uh, nutrient cycling, you know, the soil system actively makes nutrients available in a complex way for plants um, and plants drive a lot of that process. So here in this macro orchard for example, you know, the, the root systems, the leaf fall of the plants, the root systems in the canopy zone, the mulch layer, the humus, the feeding roots, this whole system drives nutrient cycling if you if you enable it, if you support that system with soil health management. So I guess in summary to optimise your nutrient management you don't just need to have nutrients in your soil, you also need to be s cycling those nutrients and that's a slightly different approach where you're you're proactively encouraging the cycling of the nutrients that are there in your soil through good soil management. And this is an example of two soils side by side in a trial in uh, Landcare Group um, where they're optimising the root zone through aeration on the right hand side. You can see the same soil but over on the right where they're, we're doing, they're doing a aeration trials, the roots are growing a lot, lot more vigorously and so it's driving a lot better uptake of nutrients for the plant even though there's the same level of fertility in those two soils. But one of them is cycling that fertility a lot better because the land management has improved root activity. So that's an example of where we're trying to optimise nutrient cycling but we haven't changed the level of fertility, it's the same on both sides. It's just that the soil on the left is not really using that fertility, the plants are not really accessing it very well. So this more holistic 21st century approach is what I call five bucket thinking. Sorry I'm not very original in my terms and it's probably a bit of an ordinary concept term wise but yeah five bucket thinking and it's just because there's more than two buckets of nutrients in your soil and um, so unfortunately we have to get a little bit more complex when we think about nutrients if we want to do it really well and try to um, lower our, if we want to lower our nutrient use and get it more efficiently used. So the five buckets include soil air, soil solution which is traditionally called the available bucket, S organic matter which is a really important bucket of nutrients in your soil, the soil colloid which is the soil CEC um, which I think we mentioned in, in uh, the first webinar if you want to go back on that and the soil minerals of course. So you know the traditional approach would say well the nutrients in the soil mineral bucket aren't really available uh, but in fact life on earth has evolved ways to 
constantly make nutrients from minerals available through things like mycorrhizal fungi, etc. So there are, it is actually a bucket of available nutrients in that way as long as I have that microbe helping me or that fungi helping me access it. So the, these five buckets, in five bucket thinking, these five pools of nutrients in your soil, plants take up nutrients from all of these buckets. So either directly, like through the plant roots, say from the soil solution, or indirectly or off the colloid, or indirectly, say, via soil microbes that might fix nitrogen from the air and then give it directly to the plant. Or the plant might get it from the soil minerals via a mycorrhizal fungi. So there are actually five buckets of nutrients that can be available for your plant if you're managing a healthy, dynamic soil community system. And that's, I guess, the key, uh, maintaining good biological fertility and soil health um, so that that plant soil system can drive nutrient cycling. So under this way of thinking, nutrients become available to plants through the activity of that whole soil community. Um, so it's not a passive process, it's an active process. Uh, and I call that the soil's nutrient cycling capacity. And it's determined by the plant root activity, the soil life, uh, soil structure, obviously water and air are critical, soil diversity and the level of organic matter which not only contains nutrients but has the carbon which is the energy for, for a lot of the life in the soil as well, their carbohydrates. So that's really what drives this capacity of my soil to cycle its nutrients effectively. So it's not just about solubility, there's a proactive uptake by plants. Plants have evolved to proactively access their nutrients um, which is you know, quite a, a little bit of a different way of thinking that a lot of assumptions around available and unavailable. Um, you need to measure not just your available or estimated available nutrients, but your total nutrients when you do this approach because, you know, plants are accessing from minerals, for example, or potentially accessing from minerals. And you can use other nutrients such as biological or mineral fertilizers as well as soluble fertilizers. There's nothing wrong with them if they're used appropriately as well. But you've got other options, I guess, from a fertiliser point of view. And the key is that you've got to manage soil health because it's a key part of driving nutrient cycling. Without soil health, you don't have effective nutrient cycling. Um, and sometimes people can use biostimulants and inoculants. Sorry, there's a typo there. Um, to help stimulate that cycling process. And some people are using that to some, with some different varying degrees of success. So there's different tools or more tools, I guess, apart from soluble fertilisers to manage fertility when you look at it more holistically. So two bucket versus five bucket thinking, we're aiming for nutrient efficiency, we're also thinking about disease suppression, soil structure, plant available water, plant health and getting consistent yields and some of the benefits of taking a more holistic approach might include lowering your cost base but also optimising plant health and yields which in the long term can lead to profit as well which is what you do see when people successfully build soil health. Um, so yeah, I've covered a bit of ground there, but I, I guess in a nutshell you've got sort of different perspectives on managing fertility and I guess in the 21st century we're starting to take a more holistic ecological view of it um, and you know try to drive nutrient cycling through managing a complex system well, um, that soil community well and how can we do that. Um, so now I'm going to sort of cover off for you guys um, the key kind of fundamental steps, I guess, for managing soil fertility well. And these apply um, whether you're managing pastures or tree crops or row crops or broad acre cropping. They're the kind of general steps that you can take. So obviously, depending on your enterprise and your yield goals and whether you're organic or conventional or anything in between, um, you might have a different sort of tactics that you'll use. But actually, the steps, I think, are common. So let's jump in and have a quick look at them. Um, so I guess it's... Um, to achieve this adequate and balanced nutrient levels, um, like this pumpkin grower, Sharon, down in North East Vic, um, who's growing pumpkins, um, you know, we're aiming for adequate and balanced nutrient levels, um, for, in this case, for pumpkins, um, but it could be for anything. Um, we need to follow a bit of a process. So if you follow a process, um, yeah, then you sort of tend to have success and spend your money in a, in a targeted, sort of efficient way, I guess. So I guess I, I'll sum it up as five steps. So um, there's sort of five steps that I think are, are useful to follow um, to get success in your nutrient management. So the first step is to really understand the total fertility levels of your different soil types. So what are the, what are the, what is the capacity and sort of production potential of different soil types? And 
I guess it comes back to Emmeline, your question about soil constraints in the north coast. It depends a little bit on the parent material. So if you're on uh, the higher fertility volcanic derived soils, you may not have uh, nutrient limiting constraints apart from say nitrogen which may not be coming in effectively from the air because you don't have enough legumes for example. Um, or, but if you're on, um, you know, you might be on a coastal soil on a different geology that's a poorer, a lower fertility geology, then maybe there are some key nutrients that are missing or, or lacking in that landscape for my, for my enterprise needs, if you like. So, so it does depend a little bit on knowing the geology and, and does my soil type have any weak links uh, in terms of um, nutrient levels. So that's the first thing, knowing your soil types and knowing the overall fertility which can be measured with the totals test and you use a soil test for that and you can get your totals tested which is an additional test to a standard agronomic test. Once you get a totals test done, you do not need to do it every year. It just gives you an idea of that overall fertility that you can potentially manage and, and optimise um, and you may need to supplement that with fertilisers depending on your yield goals. So some graziers, for example, are happy just to manage their uh, grazing enterprise within the limits of their soil type and, and use no inputs. Um, often in cropping, people want to get a little bit more and they add fertilisers, but a lot of cropping now, people are trying to minimise their fertiliser use. So can they maximise their soil inherent fertility? Here's some Northern Territory guys looking at their soil test. Unfortunately, in many areas of the Northern Territory, they have bugger all fertility. They're very ancient landscapes. Uh, hence, the guys sometimes call them white shit or yellow shit soils. Excuse the French, but that's what they call them. Hence, but just mainly because they have very low fertility. They can, however, be quite profitable because they manage them well and they understand their limitations. And they can be quite profitable running mangoes, grazing, hay production, for example, on very low fertility soils. The second thing you need to do, I guess, to manage nutrients successfully is to optimise the nutrient cycling capacity of your soil by maximising soil health. So I think I mentioned before, you need good root volume, you need plant diversity, you need a healthy soil biological community, you need air and water, so no compaction, you need, uh, if there's any chemical soil health constraints like aluminium and acidity, or sodicity in the soil, you need to address that. You really need to try and create as an ideal in balanced soil health environment to optimise root activity in the soil and that will maximise the driving of nutrient cycling. And you can see here from this example, uh, it's out of the US, this one, it's a little grazing trial where they cut perennial grass to different heights um, uh, at different periods of time just to demonstrate how you can build the root systems of grasses differently depending on your grazing management and that in turn will strongly influence uh, the cycling capacity of the topsoil. If it's got the same fertility and you graze it differently, you will actually probably drive the availability of nutrients differently. Um, you will definitely uh, do that. So that's an example for you. So obviously to, man to drive nutrient cycling capacity, you need good root systems, plenty of air and water, temperature, soil life for that system to really be optimised. Um, so that's the second step, like the first step is really to know your overall fertility, the, the soil type, um, and be realistic with what it can provide you. And the second is to make the most of what you've already got by optimising the nutrient cycling capacity of your soil. Um, the third step in, in, in what I call effective nutrient management is to then assess the available nutrient levels. Now I know I said before that we should sort of get away from that term, but it's still a useful way to think about, you know, do I have enough cycling at the moment and readily, you know, available for the season for my plants? So um, that's where the tool of looking at a soil test and looking at the available nutrients does come in handy. So it's not perfect, and but it does a job and it, is, it has been really useful for us over the last hundred years or so. So I can then use a soil test to kind of estimate, do I have you know enough phosphorus, for example, cycling through my topsoil system for plants and animals, etc., cetera, um, for the upcoming season. So you're using the soil test in a different way than for totals to just try and get a rule of thumb, okay, how much of my phosphorus is not only in the totals in my soil, but is my soil management making sure there's enough sort of available uh, for my enterprise goals? So the level of availability obviously will 
the level that you need will obviously depend on your enterprise goals as well. So for example, uh, available phosphorus, to, just to pick on phosphorus today because we can't cover too much different nutrients or we'll be here all day. But if um, I'm aiming, you know, if I'm aiming for an available phosphorus of say 30 or 20 to 30 is the goal I might have for pastures. If I'm growing uh, cereal crops, it might be 20 to 30. If I'm growing tree crops, high production orchards, I might be aiming for 50 um, available P. So whatever it is my goal is, or vegetables for example, I might be aiming for a bit higher than that. So whatever my available phosphorus goal is, I can use a soil test to see where I'm at now as an estimate. And I might have an available coal well P of 10 and my goal for vegetables might be available coal well P of 50 or 60 or 70 and I'm not there. So I don't have enough. And I could, But you can also use visual symptoms to see whether you have enough available nutrients. You can look at the plant symptoms, you know, are there visual symptoms on the plant like leaf discoloration um, and, and or the production. Is, are my cattle putting on a kilo a day or whatever my goal is um, and if not, Maybe one of the limiting factors is my nutrients. They don't have enough phosphorus. Are the animals chewing bones in the paddock? That might tell you something about your phosphorus levels. So you can use different ways to assess the availability of nutrients at any one point in time. So this is the third step in effective nutrient management is um, yeah, uh, assessing the estimating the available level nutrients in, in as, as best you can with a soil test and or field field assessment to see whether there's a limiting nutrient for my enterprise. So once you've identified that you might have a limiting nutrient, say for example you might say well my phosphorus is low or my boron I think is a bit low or whatever it is that, that I've identified that I have a feeling is a bit low and is limiting my production for my goals, my enterprise goals, then obviously you've got to try and lift the availability of that nutrient. So you have to increase the amount of that nutrient that's available. So the traditional approach was to add fertiliser, which is still a good approach at times because it adds nutrients in and lifts you to your goals, how much you need to be available. And here's an old COVID friendly fertiliser cart that doesn't have any moving parts imported from overseas. So you can fix it yourself, but I'm not sure you can buy these anymore. So you really need to, once you've got a limiting factor, lift the availability of your nutrients, um, of your limiting nutrients. So we can do this by Two, two ways and, and, and usually you actually need to do both. So the first way is we can increase the, the cycling of the existing nutrients. So you know I'm short in my phosphorus so can I improve the phosphorus cycling in my soil? Um, how can I do that? Well I can increase roots activity, maybe get more diversity, get some more mycorrhizal fungal go, fungi going and they're very essential for cycling nutrients to plants. And uh, sunflowers, for example, have a good association with mycorrhizal fungi. So maybe I grow a cover crop of sunflowers with sunflowers in it to help build those numbers up, which then cycle the phosphorus more effectively into my um, crop system. Um, so I can increase the cycling of existing nutrients by improving root system feeding um, and, and or I can add extra phosphorus. So I can obviously use a fertilizer. So here's a fruit tree crop. Um, that's well mulched and the grower here really, really effectively builds root systems in the canopy zone through really good use of mulch and side throwing the interrogue plants. Um, but they still use fertiliser um, but they get a lot more efficiency from the fertiliser because the root systems of the trees are very efficient. So they can lower their fertiliser rates and still have really good economic yields as well as really good plant health. Um, but they have to build a topsoil system to achieve that and that means feeder roots of the tree crop and feeder roots of tree crops in this case for example really like a humus layer that's where they feed. So you can see that I'm not just adding nutrients but I'm improving the cycling of nutrients by making sure I've got really good feeding root systems for that tree crop. The same principle would apply in a pasture where you're trying to optimise the feeding, the root systems of the perennial pastures through good grazing management, planned grazing management. Um, and then the final step, so you've, you've come through the process where you've looked at the total fertility and can I maximise that fertility out of my soil type through good nutrient cycling and soil health management and, and that involves good farm practices like grazing management or mulching or whatever it is, uh, cover cropping. Uh, and then I'm looking, okay, do I have any limiting available nutrients using the avail estimating available levels? And if so, 
then okay, I've got to fix that by either adding fertiliser or increasing the cycling of that nutrient that's there, if it is there. Um, and then finally, I want to keep an eye on things. So that's where obviously you have to monitor the fertility. Is it meeting your enterprise goals? So someone else might tell you, oh, you need much more phosphorus than that, but it might not be an economic level for you. So you might be happy with your production or you might just want to lift it a little bit because that's your economic sweet spot. But you need to keep an eye on it. One, on the financials, obviously it's got to be profitable. And two, the animal performance or the plant health uh, and the plant production. Am I yielding a good level of yield in this crop? Um, if not, I have to lift it up. And is it a... Is it a is it a um, sorry? Is it a nutrient limiting factor, or, or more than one nutrient? And which one do I have to address? So that's the final step, if you like, in the in the steps to success with nutrient management um, is monitoring it. Do I use a soil test for that? Um, sorry, I'll go back. I'm nearly finished. Do I use a soil test for that? Do I go out in the paddock? Um, am I looking at at yield yield uh, regularly? All of these things you need to keep an eye on. Um, to see, uh, and obviously it's tricky with with nutrients because you know in this session I've just picked on pretty much just phosphorus, and just basically you know talked through a simple example. But of course there's 13 to 15 different nutrients that plants need, uh, and sometimes those nutrients interact with each other either antagonistically or synergistically in the soil and in living systems, uh, and so it gets and we've got trace elements and major nutrients, and so it gets quite tricky in a way and you can go well I think I need trace elements or I think I need sulfur so there's a little bit too managing fertility but if you follow those five steps and just go through you know your major nutrients and then maybe some key trace elements if you suspect that um, then it and and you can also trial so you can use do a trial if you suspect for example that a trace element is, is a weak link for you you might do a trial on, on a row of, uh, of a crop or spray it on a row of trees and just observe and say, well, look, that definitely triggered change and improvement in the in the in the quality and all the, the yield of the fruit, um, or it didn't. So you know you can do some trials too because soil tests are not everything, as we've talked about before in the other webinar number two. I think you know soil tests don't tell you everything. They're a useful tool um, and they're a rule of thumb, but you need to really be proactive in observation and do some trials. If you're going to invest a lot of money in a fertilizer or a biological product that stimulates nutrient cycling, it is a good idea to trial them um, and just observe and learn for yourself as well. So in a nutshell, um, you know, soil fertility management is a big topic. Uh, it's probably, it's not the most important aspect of soil, it's equally important with soil health management. I think there's no point, you won't get effective nutrient management if your soil has soil constraints, if you have soil health issues known as soil constraints you'll never get full effective use of your fertilizers or nutrients if you have soil constraints because you're hindering root activity and soil biological function. So you really need to make sure you've got soil health, um, but then step into the five steps of, of nutrient management and you'll pretty much, I think, be on the, on the right track to sort of your nutrient management. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, that's sort of uh, managing soil fertility on your place. Um, the principles apply whether you're grazing tree crops or horticulture or cropping, broad acre cropping. Um, so I might just pull it up there. I've probably scooted through things today, so I hope it haven't been too quick for everyone. Um, but yeah, please feel free now to punch some questions into the chat. Um, we've got a question there about increasing soil biology, so I might start with that. Yeah, so Mark, I'll start with your first question. Mark's put in there, what about increasing soil biology? So I guess, Mark, you know, as part of this newer way of thinking about nutrient management and soils, generally the reason that you'd increase soil biology, whether either by adding bugs to the soil in a product or by adding a stimulant that stimulates bugs or by adding a cover crop, the, the root systems of which stimulate biology, um, whichever way you're doing it, or adding compost, for example, the reason that often people want to increase soil biology is to improve the cycling of soil nutrients. So obviously there's another reason which is disease suppression, which is a really important reason. But one of the big things that an improved soil biological community does is it cycles your nutrients more effectively. So the nutrients that are already there or the fertilizers that you add. So yeah, I think it's a key strategy and it comes into that um, optimizing nutrient cycling capacity of your soil. That's how I fit it in. 
Um, your second questionnaire, according to Christine Jones, soils have all the fertility necessary but are restricted by constraints, especially biological. Yeah, I'd, I agree with a lot of Chris's uh, comments on, on this area. I'd probably disagree a little bit that some really low fertility soils, like some granite soils, for example, um, have all the fertility for high. It depends a bit on your production goals. So if you have moderate to high horticulture production goals on on a low fertility soil, then I, my, in my experience, you've got to add some nutrients, whether it's organically or as a soluble. Um, um, but I certainly agree with with the intent that um, yeah, biological constraints are a big one for most soils, agricultural soils. Um, having lived on the granite belt um, up up near Stanthorpe and done agronomy there for many years, you know those soils are very low in fertility. And if you're a broccoli grower or an apple grower, and there's some really big apple and broccoli growers on the granite belt. Um, the level of production they're aiming for, the inherent soil type cannot provide the fertility for those. So that's an example where, you know, like adding. But I think in many soil types that are moderately to highly fertile, you know, they, are, they have got a very large amount of fertility, a lot of which is probably not being utilised because the soils aren't functioning as well as they could, uh, if, that's, if that's an answer for you. Um, Christine, to, Christine said, can you please elaborate on the link of soil carbon and nutrient cycling. Yeah, so Christine, pretty much for nutrients to change their form. So for example, for a, for a phosphorus to go from being in a mineral form, like tied up in soluble form in a rock or mineral, to becoming like available in an earthworm, you have to ex extend, uh, expend energy. And that means using carbohydrate. So just like for us to get from A to B, we've got to burn calories. It's the same for nutrients to cycle. So for a, for a fungi to get phosphorus out of a rock, it needs to ex use an enzyme, or sorry, an organic acid. So the, a mycorrhizal fungi will use an acid to excrete onto the rock to get the phosphorus. That's energy, because it has to make the acid. So, you, you're, so the fungi needs carbon to do that. It needs carbohydrate. And then when a plant wants to get that phosphorus from the mycorrhizal fungi, which now has it, the plant has to give the fungi carbon. They have to do a deal and they do an exchange. They translocate. The, the fungi gives the plant phosphorus and the plant gives the fungi carbon, sugars or exudates or whatever term you want to use. So there's always an exchange of energy for nutrients when they move from one place to another. So hopefully that gives you a brief summary, Christine. So it's the same when bacteria fix nitrogen. You know, you're, like you're on your legume, you've got the bacteria that are fixing nitrogen, the rhizobia. For them to fix nitrogen from the air, they have to have carbon. They need sugars because they need energy to do it. They need to make an, en uh, an enzyme and they need to actually live. So they need energy to do that. And then for the plant to get that nitrogen from the bacteria, it has to give the bacteria not carbon. So carbon always has to be exchanged when nutrients cycle. The only exception is when you have physical energy like electrical energy, like a storm where the nitrogen is made soluble by electricity and lightning, but it's still energy. So I guess that's hopefully a bit of a summary for you, Christine. Um, it is a bit of a technical topic. Um, righto, everyone. Um, any more questions? I think we've got a little bit of time, so feel free to throw them in. But hopefully, Christine and Mark, that's given you, given you a bit of food for thought. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, thanks for that, David. And we'll just... Um I suppose wait a couple of wait another minute or so and see if there's um, if anyone else has any questions before we before we wrap up. No worries, Gwen. I think we've got a couple of comments coming in. We're just waiting for them to type. Right. Oh, so Mark, your question is: high iron and aluminium in soils would gypsum and lime help these? So, yeah, I'm a bit reticent without sort of yeah. I, I guess it's not the form to give you specific advice, but certainly the high iron and aluminium soils can be a little bit problematic. I'm not sure exactly where you are, but if they're a ferrosol or what we call the high iron soil types, the red soils, then they often have quite a lot of phosphorus in them that doesn't cycle readily unless you have really good biological activity. They really struggle because the phosphorus gets tightly held. But I guess as a general comment, if you've got high alum exchangeable aluminium, then you're certainly disrupting nutrient cycling potential. Um, so the question is, um, can I lower that exchangeable aluminium? Um, but yeah, it's without sort of being there, yeah, it's probably not for me to give you a specific advice, but certainly, yeah, high aluminium soils, if it's exchangeable aluminium, they're usually acidic. 
uh, and so uh, lifting that acidity or lifting the pH tends to optimise nutrient cycling. It also gets rid of the aluminium uh, and that's usually with lime um, and or dolomite depending on the soil type. Um, the gypsum is usually used for a different reason, um, not so much for acid conditions, but definitely on the north coast there's plenty of acid soils and aluminium which is part of the acid story with soils. Um, but there are also the red soils, what used to be called the krasnozems, um, which have a different issue. They're very high iron, but they usually have um, different issues. All soils have issues. Uh, but yeah, so that's probably all I can sort of say, I, I guess, at this point. No worries, Kate. Thanks. So I felt like I scooted through it, Kate. So <laughs> I'm glad I gave you something. Um, uh, Peter, there is an easy way to increase carbon in your soil and that's to buy brown coal from me. No, I'm just kidding. I don't sell brown coal. Um, but I guess the way is to build plant or to build soil organic matter and it does depend a little bit on what your enterprise is. So in grazing, the best way to build organic matter in grazing is to graze for to encourage perennial grass coverage. So you have good perennial grasses and then to graze those grasses so they optimise their root zone. So that's about how you how you graze, planned grazing we call it. So yeah, that's in grazing. If you're in cropping, then cover crops and a rotation with a pasture phase is really useful. And in tree crops, um, what I've seen and, and my experience is that mulching is really really effective. Um, but there are there are other tools as well, like really high rates of compost may be part of it in some situations. It's not always economic. Um, so there's different ways to skin the cat. It's not always easy though, Peter. That's for sure. If it was easy, mate, I wouldn't be here. I'd be sitting in the Bahamas <laughs> watching the money roll in. But yeah, there's plenty of information out there, so I'll have to leave that one with you, I think, a bit more. Uh, Kate, yeah, the other webinars are available on YouTube, and Emmeline's just put it up there, so no worries, Peter. Yeah, um, thanks for that, David. It's all very interesting. Um, so it doesn't look like there are any more questions coming through, or maybe, um, but I'll just sort of start to think about wrapping up. But yeah, once again, thanks, David. It was um, all very interesting, and thanks everyone for for turning up. Um, there's now a link in the in the chat um, for a survey um, for some feedback. So if you, um, it'd be great if you guys could um, click on that and go and fill that out. Um, you should get um, a link for this to re be able to rewatch this webinar um, in, over the next few days, sometime, and it will be available on our web, um, on our YouTube page, um, along with the others. Um, so yeah, so on that note, I'm going to bring the webinar to a close. And thanks again for everyone to attending, and we'll let you know when the last webinar is going to be. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks, Grant, and yeah, thanks everyone for coming along. We hope you've enjoyed it.